good afternoon everybody and thanks pli for giving me an opportunity to speak on a very auspicious day in fact on this day there are two happy occasions and one is a sad occasion the constitution which was signed today is a very happy occasion at the same time this is today is the 219th anniversary of establishment of asiatic society of mumbai of which i am a finance secretary and everybody knows the sad occasion the terror attack on mumbai today we are going to deal only with the constitutional aspect but before we start with the constitution the making of the constitution presupposes that there has to be independence and independence movement started much earlier than ordinarily we feel of course there was a little attempt at independence in 1857 but the main attempt started with the tilak as the proponent for the freedom movement when he announced in around 1900 that freedom was my birthright and i will achieve it in 1906 dada bhai navroji demanded for self government early steps taken by british in 1909 where secretary of state morley and vice roy minto made reforms which introduced indians to the governor general executive council in 1907 Surat Congress, Gopal Krishna Gokhale demanded self-government. Immediately thereafter, in 1914, the Home Rule Movement was started by Dr. Any Bazin, which resulted in the Congress resolving of equality of status and self-governing dominions. Monte Cristo's report expressed in 1917 that India's connection with British Empire would be endorsed by wishes of the people. Mother, this is my opinion. Basin criticized before the Joint Select Committee that Government of India Bill of 1919 could not provide for any constitution to be passed by British Parliament and introduce Commonwealth of India Bill to strengthen the movement towards freedom. Mahatma Gandhi's firm assertion in 1922 that Swaraj will be a declaration of India's self-expression to our freely chosen representatives contained a vision of Constituent Assembly. In 1924, newly appointed British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald observed that dominion status of India was the idea and ideal of his Labour government. In 1927, House of Lords appointed Simon Commission, which excluded Indians in decision-making process in the matter of political and constitutional advances in India, which was a setback. Subsequently, the Declaration of Purna Swaraj or complete independence on 26 January 1930. Carried the concept of constituent assembly more vigorously. Mr. K. Munshi, the eminent lawyer from Mumbai, wrote an article, "Our Objective: Constituent Assembly," stating that through constituent assembly, India hopes to attain dignity of an enfranchised nation, fashions its will to self determination, and finds its own soul to express it through fundamental laws. In 1931. Gandhi and I have been arrived at a pact whose main features were that civil obedience this moment would be called up by the Congress and Congress will participate in the second round table conference which Gandhi and Congress leaders attended. Incidentally, there were three round table conferences in London in 1929 to 1931, but it did not result in any desired results. The first round table conference was boycotted by Gandhi and Congress. Gandhi attended the second one, but the as far as the third roundtable conference was concerned, Gandhi and the leaders were put in jail. So only some representatives only attended the conference. Now let us see the predecessor of the present constitution, which was Government of India Act of 1935. Till that time, there was no demand for Pakistan. While rejecting the Government of India Act 1935, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru asserted the constructive side of the rejection. if the constituent assembly and full publicity should be given to this public meetings the slogan of the constituent assembly must be popularized and explained to the masses that what he said mahatma gandhi stressed that the only way out of a constituent assembly through which democratic swaraj was possible all resources should therefore be exhausted to reach the constituent assembly before direct action was thought of the first general election under the government of india act took place in 1937 which resulted in congress emerging as the largest party in seven provinces of the out of 
Now, incidentally, under the Government of India Act, India was the British India was divided into provinces. So, to in order to cooperate in World War II, which broke out in 1939 on the side of British, Congress demanded that Britain should agree to establishment of constituent assembly elected by adult suffrage to frame a constitution of India. However, Samuel Hore, speaking in House of Commons on 26 May 1939, emphasized that British policy was to give India a dominion status and not complete independence. In Lahore Congress on 23rd of March 1940, Muslim League for the first time suggested a separate state of Pakistan. Stafford Cripps arrived in New Delhi in March 1942. He declared that immediately after the end of World War II, steps would be taken to set up an elected body for framing constitution of India. The provincial legislatures would elect members to sit in constituent assembly by system of proportional representation. Cripps' declaration was to gradually hand over power except defense in the hands of Indian leaders. The proposal provided for restricted membership of 207 members of the constituent body, out of which 158 members would be elected by provisional legislatures of British India and 49 members would be represented by the rulers of the princely states which was other than British India. After several criticism by Congress and Muslim League, Cabinet mission increased the numbers to 389, consisting of 296 members elected by provisional legislatures and 93 by rulers of the princely states. The number 389 would contain 78 Muslim members. In the election held after World War II in Britain, Atli became Prime Minister and announced in the British Parliament on 19th February 1946 that he was sending cabinet mission consisting of Patrick Lawrence, Stafford Cripps and Alexander to help India attain freedom. Cabinet in, uh, mission arrived in India on 24th of March 1946 but fails to convince Jinnah for political solution. In a statement on 16th of May 1946, cabinet mission in indicated that partition was inevitable. It suggested that a stable and practical form of constitution for whole of India was required with elected professional legislative assemblies as electing bodies. Lord Mountbatten took charge as Viceroy in March 1947 from Lord Wevel. On 28th of April 1947, Rajendra Prasad looking at the deteriorating communal situation, expressed that there was possibility that Union of India may not comp comprise of all the provinces, meaning that there would be a division of India and the division of some provinces. But Brit British cabinet had instructed Mountbatten to try to obtain a unitary government through constituent assembly in accordance with cabinet mission's plan of 16th of May 1946. If by October 1947 there was no prospect of reaching a settlement to the above basis, then of course he had to report back the steps which he felt necessary for handing out the power in June 1948. The Congress Working Committee adopted resolution on 8th of March 1947, whereby province of Punjab and Bengal should be divided on the basis of predominantly Muslim portion. Rajendra Prasad in his speech in Constituent Assembly on 24th of April 1947 stated that constitution will not be forced upon any unwilling part of India and there would be division of India and division of some of the provinces. Mountbatten concluded that there was no chance of Congress and Muslim League coming together in the Constituent Assembly for drafting a constitution which would have general support. The British government on 3rd of June 1947 laid following terms by observing that Representatives of majority of provinces had made progress for evolving a new constitution, but Muslim League with majority of representatives in, of Bengal, Punjab, Sindh, British Baluchistan had decided not to participate in the constituent assembly. Accordingly, the British government made it clear that it had no intention of attempting to frame an ultimate constitution for India and that was to be done by the Indian themselves. It therefore appointed boundary commission for demarcating the boundaries of the new provinces on the basis of areas to be partitioned. The British government did not wait, did not wish to wait till June 1948 and proposed to introduce legislation in British Parliament for transfer of power of dominion status without prejudice to the right of the Constituent Assembly to decide whether India would want to remain in the British Commonwealth or otherwise. Finally, on 15th of August 1947, it was decided 
you had a 14 August was decided to be the date of transfer of power. So with effect from 15, 1947, areas including the dominion of Pakistan were excluded from the jurisdiction of Constituent Assembly on passing the Indian Independence Act by the British Parliament. So from 1947, Constituent Assembly became true sovereign and body free of external affairs. Now let us go back to this. This is the history up to independence. Now let us go back to the settling of the Constituent Assembly. Setting up of Constituent Assembly was as per the suggestions of the cabinet mission in a statement on 16th of May 1946 that there were three main communities in India, namely general communities, Muslim and Sikh. General would include all those who were not Muslim or Sikhs. Since these communities were spread in different parts of British India in different portions, proportion, and on the basis of allotment of seats to communities in various provinces, it was decided to have representation of these three communities and that would be 292 in British India. Now, as regards the princely states, a number of 93 was fixed and those representatives would be included at a later date after they are represent, represented in negotiating committee. Apart from these two seats were allotted to Kurg and British Baluchistan. Accordingly, elections were held in these communal divisions and out of the general seat of 210, Congress captured 199. Congress won further seats in Kurg and Punjab and three in Muslim seats also were taken away, whereby the tally became 208. The Muslim League captured 73 out of 78 seats. Subsequently, 89 members of the princely states were added, taking the membership of the Constituent Assembly to 318. In the first meeting of the Constituent Assembly, it was held in New Delhi on, 90, on the 9th of December 1946. Dr. Sachitananda Sinha was appointed as a temporary chairman to preside over, over the meeting and swearing of the members was done. In the third meeting on 11th of December 1946, J.B. Krupalani suggested the name of Dr. Rajendra Prasad and was seconded by Sardar Vallabhai Patel and he was accordingly appointed chairman of the Constituent Assembly by replacing the provisional chairman. In the same meeting, 15 members of subcommittee for rules of procedure were appointed. In the meeting on 13th of December 1946, Pandit Nehru put up a resolution in the nature of a pledge. Sri Purushottam Das seconded the same. Dr. M. R. Jaikar moved an amendment on 16th of December 1946 for declaring India as democratic sovereign state. Rai Badu's Sham Nandan Sahai proposed further amendment by seeking to insert the words independent sovereign republic. Ultimately, the words sovereign democratic republic found their place in the preamble. On 16 December 1946, a steering subcommittee was constituted through an internal election. On 12th of December 1946, negotiating subcommittee was appointed for carrying out negotiations with the representatives of the princely states. On 23rd December 1946, Assembly constituted Rules of Procedure and Tradition Subcommittee and House Subcommittee. The meeting on 22nd of January 1947, there was an agenda on, on the agenda was a resolution regarding inclusion of Bhutan and Sikkim, which unfortunately did not happen subsequently. The Assembly resolved that negotiation committee, which was primarily formed to negotiate with the rulers of princely states, would examine the special problems of Bhutan and Sikkim and report to the Assembly. On 24th of January 1947, Assembly proposed appointment of five presidents to be elected by the Assembly in such manner as the Chairman Oblique President may prescribe. Assembly also resolved to hold election of advisory subcommittee consisting of 68 members who could include persons who were not members of the Assembly. Eventually, it was resolved to not have more than 72 members which could include non-members of the, into the Assembly. Ultimately, it was decided to have one vice president instead of five, and the president Rajendra Prasad nominated Dr. Mukherjee as the vice president. On 28th of April 1947, Assembly passed resolution appointing Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Maulana Abdul Kadam Azad, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, Dr. Pattabi Sitaramaya, Mr. Shankar Aude, and Sir Gopal Swami Ayangar for conferring with the negotiating committee set up by the Chamber of Princes and other representatives of the Indian state for distribution of the seats in the assembly not exceeding 93 and fixing method of their representation in the assembly. 
on the same day union powers committee submitted a report before the constituent assembly in respect of indirect taxes judiciary industrial disputes reserve bank of india currency and emergency powers of the union accordingly subject subjects such as insurance company law banking negotiable instruments patents trademark design copyright copyright planning ancient monuments weights and measures were also included in the draft union list in the meeting on 27th of february 1947 sardar vallabhbhai patel was appointed chairman of the committee which had under it five different sub committees fundamental rights sub committee second was northeast frontier tribal areas and assam excluded and partially excluded areas sub committee northwest frontier tribal areas sub committee excluded and partially excluded sub committee except assam and minority sub committee order of business sub committee in its second report dated 9th july 1947 recommended to the constituent assembly that a committee be appointed to scrutinize the draft constitution before its submission to the assembly accordingly on 29th of august 1947 the drafting committee was appointed to scrutinize the draft of the constitution which was prepared by the constitutional adviser mr b n rao for giving effect to the decisions taken earlier in the assembly including all matters which were ancillary there to and which have to be provided in the constitution and to submit to the assembly for consideration the text of the draft constitution as revised by the drafting committee drafting committee consisted of seven members dr b r ambedkar aladi krishna sami ayyar n gopal sami ayyangar k munshi b l mittar d p khaitan and mohammad sadullah since miller could not attend the meetings n madhava rao was appointed in his place committee met on 42 days and the draft constitution which was put up by b n rao was settled by the drafting committee and submitted to the president of the assembly on 21st of february 1948 in the vacancy created by the death of dipak khaitan it was filled up by mr t t krishnamachari apart from drafting committee members the committee meetings were also attended by the draftman b n rao constitution adviser s n mukherji joint secretary p n krishna krishna swami assistant secretary and jugal kishor sharma deputy secretary to the constituent assembly clause by clause consideration of the draft constitution was taken up by the constituent assembly between 15/11/1948 and was concluded on 17/10/1949 after the draft was adopted by the assembly it was sent for renumbering the articles revision of punctuations completion of marginal notes and was submitted to the president of the assembly on 3rd of may 1940 3rd of november 1949 some further minor amendments were considered and put to vote and passed on 16th november 1949 and the third and final reading of the constitution was done on 17th november 1949 dr ambedkar made a speech on 25 11 1949 summing up the entire effort of preparing the large largest constitution in the world having 315 articles and eight schedules and moved the moved the motion and put it to vote in support of the motion the chairman of the drafting of the constituent assembly dr radha ram rajendra prasad made a speech and took a vote of the house which passed the motion and the constitution was settled by the assembly which passed on 23rd 11 1949 and was signed by all the members of the constituent assembly now this is the how the constitution was made it will be interesting although my topic is making of the constitution as to how the constitution started working because in early years the constituent assembly itself acted as the provisional legislature in 1952 so jawalal nehru who was very keen that the agrarian reforms it was necessary to do to remove the anomalies and the zamindaris so a whole batch of agrarian reforms in different provinces were sought to be abolished by the various acts which came before the parliament after those acts were passed the some of three provinces challenged those acts one in the madhya bharat other in uttar pradesh and in bihar however madhya bharat and uttar pradesh the challenge was repelled but the bihar high court the patna high court set aside that 
agrarian reform and that really caused curiosity to the provincial government and instead of waiting for the supreme court to take any stand on the same they immediately made a constitu- first constitutional amendment whereby they introduced schedule number 9 now you to begin with constitution had eight schedules and whereby they provided in the amendment that any act any agrarian act which is put in the nine schedule will be beyond the jurisdiction of any court now the moment this particular amendment was passed the first case came before the constitution bench in 1952 was shankari prasad dev and in that case the bench headed by justice gajendra chief justice gajendra gadkar found that as far as the provision in section article 13 is concerned which provided that if any law which is passed which which affects or abridges fundamental right to that to that effect or to that to that that provision of law would become void ab initio ab initio now this particular problem of what is the definition of the word law and whether constitutional amendment made in the constituent capacity by the parliament would be called as a law and the and the constitution bench felt that if the law is made by the constituent authority then it would not amount to law and therefore the they set aside the bihar high court judgment now this particular position continued for almost 14 years till in 1966 again in another matter sajjan singh's case the constituent bench had an occasion to see because the petitioner's argument was to revisit the, the judgment in shankari prasad dev's matter this time there was a argument on behalf of the petitioners and the supreme court came to the conclusion by a majority of 3 versus 2 that it was not necessary to revisit the constituent power obviously excludes the constitutional amendment from the definition of the word law in article 13 but in the dissenting judgment there were two dissenting judgment one by justice hidayatullah and one by justice mudolkar justice mudolkar for the first time said that the power to amend a law under article 368 cannot be used for doing something which will affect the basic structure of the constitution itself now this particular doubt was casted justice hidayatullah also was of the same view so therefore although the judgment was 3 versus 2 this point again came up before a bench in 1969 which was the golaknath case where justice subarao assembled a bench of 11 judges to consider whether the doubts created by the minority judges in sajjan singh's case were correct and after the matter was heard in fact in this a matter mr palkiwala was requested to come in but for reasons known to him he did not come in directly but at a very later stage now while the matter was going on it appeared that the bench was not quite in favor of the petitioners and therefore an sos was sent to mr palkiwala to come to come and address the court at that time ironically palkiwala was representing india against pakistan in the international court and he said that he will be able to come only for one day so on a sunday palkiwala comes back mr dm popat and mr fali nariman they go and fetch him from the airport and while on their way to the to the hotel they tell him what it what was the case was and what was the stage at which it was there so palkiwala insisted that i must get a chance to argue on monday because i have to take a flight back to switzerland on monday night so mr nambia the father of the ex uh, attorney general of india mr kk venugopal he was on his legs and he was told that mr you must make way for palkiwala to argue now since he was on his legs it was not possible for him to just sit down and therefore nambiar waited for an opportunity when after about an hour of argument he was he was flooded with a barrage of questions by the by the bench and he said that your lordship said put all these questions i need a time little time to reflect on it uh, so if you allow me i will come back and address them but in the meantime mr palkiwala can address and the bench was very cordial and they said palkiwala could argue now palkiwala raised the point of implied limitation now implied limitation means there are certain limitation which are specific 
and there are certain limitations which are to be implied by the provisions in the constitution itself and that particular argument of implied limitation ultimately was the crux which decided the matter by again a vapor thin majority of 6 versus 5 where the judgment for the majority was delivered by justice koka subbara and the, and the judgment was so extreme that it was held that the constitutional amendment fell within the definition of the word law and therefore any constitutional amendment made which abridged or affected the fundamental rights that particular amendment would become void now the effect of this was that all the constitution amendments which were made before uh, from 1950 onwards they all would become void so it was a very critical stage the indira gandhi government was completely stirred and they in the meantime 24th and 25th constitutional amendments were passed whereby they wanted to straight away make the effect of golaknath case completely void by passing legislation and also they passed the kerala land act which is land reform act whereby the property of kerala math was sought to be acquired and therefore that also infringed the right of freedom of religion ultimately palkiwala was asked to come to the to challenge the kerala uh, land reform act and also the 24th and 25th constitutional amendment he was rather reluctant because he said it's going to take a very long time so mr mc chagla then of course retired from the high court and one of the best judges bombay high court had he was the person who was asked to take up the mantle he said i am too old now i can't take all this he requested ck daftari another competent person ex attorney general of india he also said i am too old so they both decided why not ask palkiwala so ultimately palkiwala agreed and he represented the the famous and the biggest case ever in the constitutional history his holiness keshavananda bharati versus state of kerala now this was a matter where there was lot of things which happened in the background seeing that palkiwala was going to represent the petitioners the state of kerala instead of asking either their advocate general or the attorney general of india near and day to appear they briefed mr h m sirwai another expert on the constitutional law and there was a little backstage happening such as mr sirwai insisted that after the petitioners argue the matter he will give a reply ordinarily it would have been the right of the attorney general to address but attorney general made a complaint to the law minister mr gokle and the complaint was ultimately taken to the prime minister and the message came from the prime minister that let mr sirwai argue there after you argue so with that the matter started it lasted for 66 days the supreme court used to hear this matter on tuesday wednesday and thursday every week so actually it lasted for almost 66 days out of which the our petitioners argued the matter for 32 days sirwai for 21 days and attorney general and others argued the main crux of the matter was that if the parliament had a power under article 368 to to amend the constitution can that power be used for amending any part of the constitution and this particular matter was addressed by the palkiwala by giving various examples well this matter itself can be a, a special two hour session can be addressed on this matter itself but in a short i can tell you that palkiwala first saw, showed the preamble itself we are a democratic sovereign republic so sovereign means we had just uh, become sovereign after the british government was thrown away we were democratic because we had adult franchise whereby by elections a government could be thrown out or continued at every f- a period of 5 years and we were republic because we had taken the westminster model whereby we had a president as as the head and he would act according to the aid and advice by the prime minister and the council of ministers so he said that now you cannot change this particular thing by converting this into a dictatorship or you cannot take away the right which is given to the people of selecting the government every 5 years although this particular constitution had some portion which was based on the government of india act of 1935 but there was no provision for adult franchise 
as the government of india act provided that only people who are taxpayers and people who are graduates in any faculty were allowed to be the voters so this was one of the this, this was one of the reasons then we had the liberty fraternity and equality now these principles also cannot be diluted because these are the bulwark of our constitution and he gave many examples whereby he ultimately demonstrated that in the constitution there are some implied limitations and there were certain aspects of the constitution which can be easily pronounced as the basic structure of the constitution ultimately this also by a vapor paper thin majority of 7 versus 6 the matter was succeeded and ultimately the basic structure theory was accepted and that too by a pivotal judgment of justice khanna now after this this particular judgment prevented the government from passing any amendments whereby any infraction of the fundamental right or other put other portions of the parlor of the constitution which could subscribe as a basic structure could be could not be destroyed and they, so ultimately in a, in two years time chief justice ray constituted a bench for reviewing keshavan the bharti case now it was a very unprecedented move about five to six judges who were there on the keshavan the sub original keshavan and the bharti matter were had retired and some new judges had come and <laughs> palki wala was told by the that please come back and and see that this particular review is dismissed palki wala argued the matter on preliminary by by raising points on preliminary objection and at some at the end of the second day the question came as to who had asked for this review and uh, the chief justice said well one of the advocate generals must have asked for it so the advocate general of gujarat and madras uh, they said that we have not asked for it so then it became very embarrassing so chief justice for first said that you must have asked he said palki wala said why should i ask then my whole judgment on basic structure falls down so it was ultimately realized that it was nobody else but justice ray on his own had constituted this bench and on the third day morning when palki wala was about to commence his argument justice ray said bench dissolved and walked out it is very funny that you have a review petition for which no papers are available you have, and and there was no there is no person who had asked there is no person on record who has asked for the review petition and therefore there is no judgment also so this is the second time that palki wala prevented the constitute the basic structure doctrine from being affected in any particular day thereafter in every matter whenever there was any law which is passed including the 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 one which was passed for the national judicial commission law wherever they felt felt that the basic structure of the constitution is affected they would set aside the law so i heard you throughout the session and one of the questions i think a lot of people would have is i mean uh, like you talked about uh, keshavanand bharti case where state of kerala wanted to appoint um, someone who is an expert in the constitutional law so i wanted to ask how lucrative do you think the practice of constitutional law is in india and for someone who wants to take up that as a career path i mean what should be the you know guiding steps or how can someone reach that sort of a stage to call themselves eventually a constitutional expert the yeah, first thing first and foremost let me explain that in the keshavanand bharti case palki wala had never met keshavanand bharti it was a bunch of almost 25 to 30 petitions and they just picked up this particular matter now palki wala did not appear free he did not charge keshavanand bharti but he did not appear free there were other uh, there were other companies and industries which were also affected by the 24th and 25th constitution amend 29 constitutional amendment so therefore they had funded his particular thing because palki wala who argued for the matter for almost 30 days so so he could not it is not possible for him not to charge that is one secondly to answer your question constitutional law is something which is a which is a ongoing thing because we have already made more than 100 constitutional amendments so person who wants to practice in the constitutional law first i think the first step should be to do llm because in llb you only get a basic knowledge there is only one paper in which you appear and thereafter there is nothing so you must do llm and you must start attending a chamber of a person who 
practice is constitutional law and therefore you will get a little bearing of what happens uh, in the court when the constitutional matter comes in other option is that if you can join a chamber of a judge as a as a as a student because there are so many students are taken as assistants for doing research etc whenever you, you can of course you can't choose a judge but uh, if you apply and you are given a judge who incidentally happens to be sitting on in writ matters because these constitutional matters come in before the court in writ petitions so i am talking basically suppose you are in bombay and you want to do it or in any other high court then you will have to then you will have to join a, a chamber of a judge and try to understand more about the writ petitions but if you get an opportunity to uh, join a judge in the supreme court then there is nothing like a, a bench which takes a constitutional all the judges take all the matters and in fact right now if you know there are at least four constitu uh, constitution benches constitution bench consists of five judges so they are taking all the constitutional matters so therefore if you get an opportunity to join a chamber of a judge in the supreme court extremely good so thereby you will come to know whether you actually want to practice restrict yourself to the practice of constitutional law or you want to know generally other laws also because you cannot be specific at the student stage that you want to become a constitutional expert it's over a period of time as you start gaining uh, gaining experience becoming a lawyer starting appearing and then you need a you need a senior with whom you uh, with you work who is doing a constitutional law practice then only there is a chance that you immediate there thereafter you can say that now i want to only concentrate on constitutional law practice uh you said in writing of the constitution there were multiple people involved how yes. is it that we are always taught that it was ambedkar who wrote the constitution uh yes he presented it but uh, how did that come about number 1 and is that uh, you know reservation um, uh wasn't it part of the basic constitution uh, and it was supposed to be just for 10 years is that baked into the original constitution so two questions the first first question is that if in a cricket match if a team wins then the captain gets the that he yes we won because of virat kohli as a captain or rohit sharma whatever yeah same thing here therefore i emphasize that the initial part of the, the constituent assembly was for the 19, in 1946 and drafting committee came much later so between this time there were a lot of deliberation which took place on every aspect of the constitution all those deliberations were reduced in the form of a draft constitution in spite of the fact that there are 300 and odd people there was mr b n rao as a as an advisor to the constituent assembly so he was actually advising 300 and odd people and he had a team of his own which drafted the constitution like a skeleton now this skeleton was made on the basis of all the discussion that took place before this particular skeleton was placed before the drafting committee now drafting committee also had allari krishnaswamy here and mr k m munshi who had done a stellar job in drafting because both were lawyers so again mr ambedkar's contribution i would say that ultimately after the the mohammedan uh, gentleman who walked out of the constituent assembly it was the people who worked in it must get the credit equally just because mr dr ambedkar was the chairperson that doesn't mean he gave a constitution or something therefore i emphasize the point that drafting committee did not draft the constitution they settled the draft of the constitution so therefore and in settling as i said there were 42 sessions it was not only ambedkar who was doing it in all the 42 sessions most of the members of the of the drafting committee were present and participated so if if the impression which is given is that dr ambedkar gave this constitution it is not exactly true he must have as a drafting committee he presented the draft eventually to the constituent assembly which also deliberated please understand where the draft was given for almost a one year or something they were still the constituent assembly was still talking about it and they ultimately it was that draft was settled with lot of amendments lot of things there are nine volumes of books on debates in constituent assembly if somebody is interested they should go through the debates so thereafter a situation came where the draft was finalized so i think that is the first answer secondly as far as the reservation was concerned it was not part of the constitution it it came subsequently and that too for 10 years it was it was there and now for political reason it has been extended in fact if you are if you are reading newspapers the last constitution bench there was a discussion and two of the judges felt that it is time that we revisit 
that reservation policy as a whole. So instead of continuing the reservation policy and adding more and more uh, uh, tribes and castes and etc. into it, we must now start removing them so that the principle of Article 14 of equality before law and equal protection can be attained. So the government should set itself a date that by this date, all the reservations will go away. So that all the people who are otherwise deprived for whatever reason are brought to a level where there is a level playing field and all the reservations will be done away with and Article 14 will have full effect. Why our constitution has been designed based on British? Uh, was there any other perspective? Now, the first thing is that it was not designed by the British because Britain does not have a constitution. We don't have a written constitution. So the various boundaries or various uh, acts which were around was the Government of India Act of 1935. Then we had the Indian Independence Act of 1947. Then as far as the basic freedoms etc. are concerned, it, it was adopted from the US constitution. And there are there were other constitution from which certain parts were taken like the Japanese constitution, the German constitution. This is post-World War II when those countries who had suffered because of their uh, because they were faced with policies, they had come up with democratic provisions and some of the constitutions even provided that they were, that the fundamental rights cannot be touched at all. Something in, in consonance with the judgment of Justice Subarao in uh, Golaknath case. So it is not as if we have, uh, the British have drafted. On the contrary, the, the condition which was put by the, by the uh, provis provincial legislature here and the Congress was that the constitution shall be drafted by our own people. So British were not involved in the drafting of our constitution at all. Well, certain concepts, certain things, etc. were taken from so many democratic countries and certain concepts were taken from the unwritten constitution of England also, like the <coughs> Republic, because there the Queen is heading it. Here we have a president. Both of them are of the, of the same stature. So it is not as if we have taken anything from the British as a base. What are some features of the constitutions of India, constitution of India, which is unique to India only? If I tell you that our Supreme Court is the most powerful court in the world, you'll be surprised because there are two things. First thing is, even to an extent, even the, the High Court. First thing is that after the constitution was uh, signed, sealed and delivered, Ambedkar was asked the question, if somebody has to ask you, uh, which is that one article, which is the, the, the kingpin of all the articles, 300 odd articles. And he said, article 32. This is an article where for infringement of fundamental right, the, the, uh, the citizen can straight away approach the Supreme Court, doesn't have to go to any lower judiciary. So he can straight away for any infraction of fundamental right, he can directly approach the Supreme Court. So that is the, that is the one unique thing which is there in our constitution. You were just now, sir, talking about Article 32 and how we can straight away approach the Supreme Court. Currently in the news, uh, we're hearing a lot about, um, you know, the Marriage Act, wherein people want recognition for uh, marriage between the same genders. Yes. Now, under Article 21 uh, is what they are contending that, you know, uh, a person has a right to uh, marry a, a person of their own choice. So, yes. uh, so a person uh, has a right uh, to live with dignity and all of that yes, is yes, covered yes. under that. Yes. And they're contending that, yes, uh, they... they they can marry a person of their choice and for the choose of the word person they say that you know both genders are equally covered under that so yeah. uh, would you say sir that in the marriage act since um, would you say first of all that it is contradicting to the constitution of india itself and if that is so uh, that uh, not allowing not recognizing such marriages uh, would make the law itself void in a sense there is a law which provides that there are the suppose there is a marriage law which provides that there shall be a marriage between the two different genders. Then, then this particular law for the person of same gender, if they want to marry, they have to challenge that provision of the law in the Supreme Court and then plead about the equality, etc. So here you will have to first challenge the provision of the law. 